So today's topic is gonna to be about the reef reset. And this topic's not been given publicly. This is a new one. And last night I was out a little too long and I was talking a little too loud and I kind of threw my voice out. So I'm sucking on a cough drop to keep me speaking through this presentation. So hopefully it's not too bad or distracting. Now, the reef reset is the process of, is it time to do something with your tank because it's grown in too well? And think about that for a minute. To be so successful with your tank that it's too full, that it has literally grown to the point that you need to deal with it. I mean, it's basically like gardening and you have a yard and you have grass and you have bushes and trees and flowers and you never touch it. And the grass gets taller and taller and the trees get thicker and you know, it just gets to be a big jungle, it's a mess. And you could even start to have die off because of that because things are getting shaded or they're being um, encroached upon by other plants. So in the situation of the reef, we have to consider, does our tank need this? And so this conversation is actually both sides of the conversation. Do you need to do this or do you not need to do it? And you have to consider what is going on in your tank to decide if there's an actual problem you want to solve. So in my own situation, that's, this topic is really about what I did with my tank. And I wanted to share why I did what I did. And when I did my reef set a few months ago, back in June, it wasn't long after I did that, my tank had this horrible decline that I shared on YouTube. And so I thought, well, I really can't talk about the reset <laughs> because clearly I did something terribly wrong. But the whole point, and so I'm gonna explain all that. The, the whole point of or doing a reset in my situation was the coral health was not good and I couldn't add new thing. If I tried to get new fish or I tried to get new invertebrates, they didn't live long because the water was not right and I couldn't seem to correct the water no matter what I, product I tried, no matter how much effort, no matter how much willpower, it just, I could not get nitrates to come down and I'd been working on trying to lower them with different products we can buy as hobbyists for the last three years. And I tried something for nine months and I tried something else for nine months and I kept thinking one of these is gonna work and I can say that's the product you guys should be buying because it totally does the job. But I never got to that point, it didn't work. In the meantime, during this year, I was watching these giant colonies in my tank. They were big, but they were pale. They, they lacked the color you expected. They were alive, but it didn't look good. And when I'd see your pictures on Instagram, or I saw your pictures on Facebook, or I'd see vendors selling corals, and they're so, so vivid, and I'm looking at my tank, I'm like, ugh, my tank doesn't look anything like those corals. I'd, had, I'd get the occasional comment. Some of my YouTube followers are very honest. And one guy said to me, you know, you sound like you know what you're talking about, but your reef looks like crap. And I was just like, you're not wrong. It's horrible. And part of it was the webcam I was using never looked good. And I replaced the camera and it got a little bit better. But there was, the corals were big, but they weren't healthy. They weren't vivid. There was no angle that was good. <laughs> And I said, I've got to do something. Four years ago, I flew Dwayne out to my house. He's a friend of mine from Seattle. We've been friends forever. And I had him do a reset with me back then. And you'll see a picture here in a moment. And so I contacted him this year and said, Dwayne, I'm flying you out here again. He goes, no, 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 we got COVID, we got this. And I was like, I'm gonna need you for this one. And he said, you know, well, let me know. And I said, look, I'm gonna sweeten the pot. I'm gonna let you come out for an entire week and you're gonna fix everything wrong with my sheetrock in the house and I'll pay you. And then you can help me with the reef tank too. And you know, he was like, yeah, whatever, that's fine. And you know, so he actually did come out. But my goal was to improve the flow in the tank. I wanted to resolve any kind of coral warfare that was happening that I couldn't identify. Because like I said, the corals just weren't healthy. So something was happening chemically and I couldn't put my finger on it. And ICP didn't help me either at that point. And when I, I did a test in April and I was like, okay, everything's kind of normal but the tank doesn't look good. Now you may say, well, the reason I want to do a reef set is because everything underneath the corals is dead and it's just wasting space and my stuff's like really tall, but only the top part is pretty. Everything underneath is, you know, just skeleton. Or you may have too many algae concerns. Things are just growing that are happening due to nutrients. Or it could just be you're running out of space. So this was us four years ago in 2017. And that Montipora and that huge Sunset Acropora, I'm sorry, that uh, Shadowcaster Acropora, that's a four foot by three foot section that moved as one piece. And it was all at the top and everything underneath was dying because it couldn't get any light. These corals were monsters 
And it was, Dwayne's face is really telling there because he had just snipped one little skeleton point and he thought he'd be cutting and cutting and cutting, you know, all underneath to get this thing loose. And he cut one and he went to the second point and he cut that and the whole thing went clunk. It was two little sticks holding it all up. It was amazing. So that day in 2017, I invited DFW Mass members over and I had someone work in the barbecue and I had someone work in the kitchen. And I said, just keep everyone with food and drink. And as we break up all these corals, everyone's gonna go home with corals and it's just gonna make space because I can't keep all this stuff. But I love my reef and I love my corals and I didn't want to sacrifice a single polyp either. So, I mean, yes, I'm giving away but every life matters and I'm not gonna give up any coral. And Dwayne kept throwing things away. He would just take big pieces and he'd throw it away. He goes, and he'd make sure I was looking the other direction or I was on the other end of the tank. And I was like, what was that? He goes, nothing, nothing happened. And he just kept working. And people, one guy, I remember he went in there and he was like, Mark's gonna be so mad you did that. And he was like, it's fine, it's fine. But I remember there was this one specific coral that he had in his hand and he carried it to like a tank, it didn't fit. So he went to a trough and it didn't fit. And he went to a cooler and it didn't fit. And so he just took the coral and went to the edge of the cooler and just snapped it. And then he put the pieces in there because you can give that to the fish store. So yes, the corals were really big and it was why I had to do the, reef, the reset back then. This year, my problem, like I said earlier, was the corals were fading, but I also had an RTNing event where just random corals would just go up in smoke and I could not figure out a cause. There was no rhyme or reason. And it wasn't just SPS corals. I also was seeing like one polyp of a hammer coral just die out of a huge patch of them. And then one over here would die and it would, and then one over here and then two in the top, but it was all over, you know, weeks and months. It just, one kept going away. And I thought, what is happening? So I wanted to get in here and solve it. I wanted to fight the nitrates and get rid of them. They were constantly, consistently measuring at 80 PPM. So when it comes to doing a reset, the first thing I would do is say, call a friend. You definitely want someone that's gonna help you because doing it by yourself is really exhausting, no matter the, the size of your tank. Small tank or big tank, it's still a lot of work, a lot of effort, and having someone that can hold something or take it from your hands is really useful. You wanna have different kinds of vessels to put your stuff in. You're gonna need a ton of salt water because what I would recommend you do is take water out of the tank and put it in the vessel, and then as you're taking corals out, they go in the same water they're used to. Don't, like, don't fill up all the bins with like new salt water and then take this coral out of your 80 ppm nitrate and put it in perfect water and then think you're gonna do something with it later because the coral's gonna be thinking, what just happened? You're gonna need ladders, step ladders, step stools, benches, something like that to work, depending on how tall your tank is. My system has that wonderful walk board you can stand on. All kinds of cutting tools, gluing tools, towels galore, you wanna have that. You might want a shop vac. You may need to consider what you have to do after you're done. I mean, if you're messy, if this thing gets away from you, you may be getting your carpets clean too. So here was my tank um, in June of this year. And you can see there's a lot of big colonies, but there, and there is some pretty colorful stuff in there, but it really wasn't the colors it needed to be. So the next step is gonna be, what do you wanna do and how do you wanna accomplish it? And I'd spent weeks agonizing on decisions of what I was gonna remove, what I was gonna keep, where it was gonna go, what I was trying to do with the end of the tank. Let me go back one slide. Can I zoom in? I cannot. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> on the right end of the tank, that is the, the end view of my aquarium. And the hammers were so tall and the gargonians were up and everything was blocking the view. And when you stood there looking, you saw these corals right here. And the whole reef for seven feet was kind of barely visible. It was all, and so my goal was now, I wanted to make it where the, the reef crest went uphill and here's this huge coral colony in the background. And that was an important stage for me. And so that was part of it. And each day while Dwayne was at my house, he would look at my tank and we would talk and I'd say, how do you want to handle this? You know, how would you do this? Or he'd say, well, what do you think about that coral? What if we took it and put it over here? And then literally changing the look of the reef, which in general, I don't do. I'm not a big fan of change. I, I tend to stick with something forever, but I was really at that point was like, change everything. Change everything in the tank, change everything in the house. I don't care. We're gonna make some change. We're gonna solve some things. And I remember telling him, you know the shadow caster that's always in the middle of my reef? And he's like, yeah, I don't want it there anymore. And he just looked at me and was like, what? I said, I want it to be over here on this end of the tank. So that way it's not blocking the view and there's this huge colony on the end. It's gonna look really good. 
And then I pointed to this one piece of uh, Milka coral, which is this very hard, bright purple stylophora. And it's, you know, it was a few pieces I got from the 20,000 gallon reef on Long Island. And it had grown up and then all the fingers went that way. <laughs> so it was this huge block of coral that's super hard to cut. And I saw this one spot and I said, hey, Dwayne, you see that right there? He goes, yeah. I said, I want that piece only in the new setup. And he just looked at me and because again, like last time, I, you can't kill anything. And now I'm like, I only want that. I don't care about the rest. And he was just like, what has happened to you? Who, where is Mark Levinson? And he was like, and he says, I'm kind of proud of you. <laughs> so that coral is now in the back of my reef in a spot and it's doing perfectly fine. And you see it in my videos as I pan past the leather coral. But again, don't make decisions rapidly on the fly. Try to plan ahead what you're trying to accomplish with your tank and take your time. There's no deadline on this. If you want to do this reset on your system and you're mentally not there yet, you should wait. Wait a few weeks until you've got your brain exactly where it needs to be and then communicate with the person that's going to help you what you're going to accomplish too so they understand and they're on the same page. It's fine for them to say, I'll do whatever you need, but it's so much better when they know what you need before you need it. So if you can say, look, you're probably going to need to have some buckets handy and like, okay. And then, you know, you start doing things like, oh, and they will quickly <laughs> pick up on the learning curve. But in this situation, I had to prepare myself mentally for how much we were going to remove and throw away. And we filled up two and a half, three buckets of coral skeleton. And that's not like coral that we threw away that was like good living tissue. That was the underneath that was making my reef so tall. Because in a natural reef in the ocean, the corals grow up and up and up. Everything underneath is the former reef. It is these, the, the, the foundation, the cornerstone of the reef. And then a hurricane comes through and destroys it all. And it's all leveled out and there's pieces everywhere and starts growing again. That's why the reefs we have don't just grow out of the ocean and get burned by the sun. It's because there's always damage and bringing it back down. And I wanted to lower my reef and open up that swimming space over the top so that the fish could swim and there'd be room for the corals to grow up again. Uh, one of the things I didn't plan to do <laughs> was to clean up my frag system that I've been complaining about for three years. And I mean, that tank is just, I've ignored it, I've ignored it. It had Mahanos, it had bubble algae, it had, you know, just issue after issue. The water quality was never good in there. I could never fix it. It was another one of those ones, like, it wasn't a nitrate thing. Calcium would never come down. And I, I hadn't dosed it in years. And it was always like 500, 600, 800. I'm like, what is happening? And so Dwayne said, we really have to use that tank. We're gonna have to clean it out. And I was like, well, that's not part of our big project. He goes, yeah, but I think it'll make it a lot easier. So we went ahead and we drained it down to the acrylic panel, removed all the substrate that was in there. I had brand new bags of sand that had never been used before. That's what you see in here is the brand new sand. And we then looked at all the rock and there was all this man-made rock, you know, not the live rock I like to use. And he'd say, what is this? Where did it come from? And I was like, there was this vendor and he said, I want you to try out my rock. And I said, okay, and he sent it to me. And I never heard from him again, and the company never happened. So apparently it wasn't a good choice for what the rock was made of. And it was probably part of the reason my calcium never came down. It was probably why corals wouldn't live in there. It was an ongoing battle. So uh, we actually eliminated quite a few pieces of rock we didn't trust, got rid of it, and just used the ones we totally could trust. And those Dwayne put through acid, then you put them through bleach, and then you put them through dechlorinator, and then you put them in this tank. So the tank was kind of set up almost new on the fly. The filtration underneath, the skimmer, the refugium, all that stuff was still operational, but the tank itself was new sand, completely sterile rock, and we drained water out of the reef into there. So it was the horrible 80 nitrate water. So that way the corals would recognize their water when they got moved. And then we started pulling things out. And so you can see how the water lines come down here in the tank because we already siphoned out 60, 80 gallons of water. We filled up the frag system. We filled up a giant white uh, igloo cooler. So we had places to put corals. And the corals are at the surface. We would go ahead and remove them and carry them into the other room. So this area here behind the copper band, Dwayne was taking out some of the rocks and chipping off the coral a piece at a time. And he called me over to there because he says, I cannot believe all the different colors of coral sponge you have in this rock. He says, I've never seen this many colors in one piece of live rock. And it's, I just love live rock. <laughs> you get all this wonderful life. There was red and orange and blue and green. 
and he was like, man, I haven't even seen this tan colored one. And he was like, and you got the white sponge. And he quickly cut off all the skeleton that was no longer alive that had been under some other coral. And then we quickly put the rock back in the system so that the sponge wouldn't die. Yeah, you probably know, and if you didn't, when you remove any kind of rock from your tank that has sponges on it, the longer it's exposed to air, the more likely the sponge will die. And as the sponge dies, when you put that rock back in your tank, it can add ammonia, it can cause problems, and you could kind of put your tank through a mini cycle. And with a reset, we're not trying to start a new tank. We're trying to make big corrections, but keep the system running. We're cleaning house. And so in this situation, that's what he was doing. I went ahead and I tested all the water before we started. And then when we were done, I tested the water again to know where my water parameters were. Because quickly people said, well, you just removed a lot of coral. Are you going to adjust your alkalinity consumption? Are you going to adjust your calcium reactor? And I said, yeah, actually, I'm totally on top of that because I expected that. I don't have all these huge colonies soaking it up. I've taken out a whole bunch of living coral. I've taken out a whole bunch of dead coral. And I really wanted to clean up the sand bed. That sand bed in my tank was almost eight years old. Let's say seven and three quarter years old. And I could never clean it in that entire time because I had this horrible habit of putting corals on the sand because it's like, oh, it'll go there and I'll move it someday. And then it just grows into a colony and I'm like, well, I can't move it because I got nowhere to put it. <laughs> and so I had all these corals growing in the back and I had big corals in the front. When I talked to Dwayne about this, I said, look, we're gonna have to remove all these corals off the sand because I really wanna siphon the sand bed. And he says, well, we can't do it all at once. I said, no, I know. I actually did a section of this already a month ago. And now we're gonna do the end of the tank and the back of the tank. And he's like, okay, that's better. because we're... And so we actually worked on this for three nights. It wasn't, a... cause he was busy fixing my sheetrock. <laughs> but as soon as he was done working, I put him to work and we started working on the tank next and we'd be up till three in the morning. And we went ahead and we would siphon out, as, and you'll see some of it. Uh, we siphoned out a ton of brown muck. We didn't come across sulfur pockets. We didn't come across black sand. It, the sand was fine. It just had a ton of detritus in it after all these years. And it was literally the contributing factor of why my nitrates continued to be high and would not come down. Well, I don't like to get rid of sand. I, you know, people are like, well, if you go bare bottom, you'll never have this problem but I find that to be completely unnatural. And whenever I go scuba diving, one of the first things I do for any kind of video or pictures I take, look, there's sand in the bottom of this reef in the ocean. <laughs> That's why I have sand in my reef tank at home because it feels natural to me. When I look at a bare bottom tank, I understand why they do it, but it looks like a museum piece, like a museum display. You think about the dinosaurs, they're in a big glass box and it's pristine and there's no dust. And yeah, that's an exhibit. But for something that's living, I mean, look at these planted tanks out here. Do they have any bare bottom planted tanks out here? Do they have any bare bottom freshwater tanks? I, I, didn't, I don't think I saw one. They all have some kind of substrate. Usually people say, well, I want to have a lot of flow and the sand just blows around, so I'm just not going to do sand. All right. For me, I feel like if you arrange your flow in the tank properly, you can have a sand bed. So what we did in this trough, we were moving corals over. The only thing we put in there was a heater and an air stone, no power head. I wasn't trying to circulate the water. I just didn't want the water to lose its oxygen or its temperature. And the bubbles rising was enough to create a little bit of circulation, but we could still see in there to see the corals we were working with. Now, there, you're gonna come across a few different problems when you're working on a reset. And the first one's gonna be colonies are too big to put back in your tank. And if you've ever accidentally bumped a coral in your tank with your elbow, you're working over here and tunk, and it falls and you try to put it back and it literally will not go back the way it just was. It's been like that forever. All I have to do is literally put the puzzle piece back and it won't. And you're like, okay, I'll turn it slightly. No, okay, don't try. And you try everything and no matter what you do, it won't go that way. Same thing. So here we are, we're removing big things. We're gonna need to cut them down. But rather than just having little one inch frags to start from scratch, which would feel like forever ago, it's much better to take your bigger colony and break it down and get the the best piece, the choicest part of the coral, and maybe the size of your fist, and plant these little fists in your tank. So your tank already looks halfway there, and in about six to nine months, your tank will look fantastic. But if you start with a lot of little frags, like so many of us did in the beginning, you'll just have a lot of little frags in your tank, and you'll feel like it's gonna be two years before your tank looks halfway back to what you want. So it's much better to just get things down to a small piece. And so you may have this beautiful monopora colony and there's like this one scroll in the middle. That should be your new piece for the, the replanting. You may have a huge acro colony and there's like one perfect branch. Snip that branch off and it'll plant here. 
You may have parietes and pasillopora or you have fungias. I mean, there's so many different shapes and sizes, but try to find your best of the best and use those as your new established reef for your, your reset and remove all the ones that aren't quite as good or uh, just too darn big to put back in the tank. You may want to change your aquascape. You may say, I've always had it this way, but I want to change it. My aquascape has always been the same for the entire duration of this reef tank. It's two horseshoes and then there's a flat balmy at the end. And a balmy is just like a low area of coral, usually over a sand bed, <laughs> as best I can. And uh, every time Dwayne comes, he's like, all right, this time we're gonna change your aquascape. And as soon as we get under the corals, he goes, man, your aquascape is perfect. We're not touching it. I was like, I know, it's a perfect aquascape. I love what I have. I really like the horseshoes, because you can have the corals growing and you can have this alcove or cave that the fish go into. Or you may find some kind of coral that kind of fits in there in that spot but it's also an area of a little less flow because your flow is moving this way, your flow is moving this way, but this is a little bit more of a calm area and certain corals can't handle a lot of flow while other corals need a ton of flow. Uh, any of the corals that are completely blah, they're just so hideous, you're gonna choose, do I even wanna put them back in my tank again? Do I wanna replace them with new ones? And as you're planting the corals in your tank, this is where we wanna do the color wheel approach. And more and more people are talking about this now. I've seen more YouTube videos discussing it. I've heard MACNA presentations on this topic. And basically the color wheel is a bunch of slices of color. And they say that the, the most aesthetic and pleasing look is whatever color is on the wheel that you're holding in your hand, the next coral next to it should be the opposite side of the wheel. So I'm not gonna tell you you put this with that. I'm just telling you, you can look at the wheel and you'll see green and maybe the opposite side is red. You look for a red coral to put near the green one and they'll look great. I have this terrible habit of like, I got a brand new coral, I'm so excited. And you're like, and that's the only spot it'll go in. And I put it in there and it's the same color as everything in that area. And so it just becomes blah. It, it's, there's no diversity, there's no colorful, what am I trying to think of, an interaction. We wanna see it all completely, you know, Yes, I don't want to look like a candy store, <laughs> I, but I do want to kind of break up and avoid being monotone, 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 because I would have all the brown and all the green, and here's some oranges. <laughs> and it was, and I'm looking at my tank like, I'm so bad at this. And so I, I literally will take my time and say, okay. And I did this in a video recently. I don't know if you guys noticed it. I didn't say it, but I was doing it. I held the coral in my hand and is filming, and I kept putting it next to things. What is this the opposite of? And when I was all done, I was like, yeah, it's going right back where it was. Because <laughs> I couldn't find a good spot for it. But I did try, I was thinking it. So if you're better at that than me, congratulations, do it. And I'll probably be like, man, your tank looks amazing. Thank you for sharing it with us, you know? Because I really do love that stuff. Um, some, these are some of the perks of my own system. I just wanted to share them. First of all, I have a huge poly tank behind my reef tank that holds 250 gallons of salt water. So before Dwayne and I even touched the tank, I made sure that was completely full to the top, the right salinity, the right temperature, the right alkalinity. So that way, no matter what happened, we had a lot of water on hand. The walk board that I use that goes into the front of my tank can be removed and put on the back of the tank. So it works from either side and it can hold two people plus stuff. I've had two people on the walk board with bags of salt or with bags of sand and we're just hoisting them in together. It's really strong. It's a it, the stupid walk board is so heavy, I hate moving it. I had one that the guy welded the first time. It was really hard to insert. He goes, I'm so sorry. It fit perfectly until I powder coated it and now it's rubbing. And so for years I'd like jam in one side and then I'd jam in the other and I'd come back to the front and I go over here and I go this. And I kept going back and forth till I got both legs into the stand and I'd walk on it. And then event, and I tried greasing it, I tried everything. And I'd pull it out and carry it to the other room, the back of the room and put it in the back. And another welder says, man, I can make you a new one that'll slide in like a glove, you'll be so happy. It's gonna be so much better. I was like, okay, go ahead. So I let him have my walk board and he took it away. And of course, for those two weeks, I needed it like a hundred times. And I was like, ah. Oh. And then he came back and he goes, it's a little bit heavier. I'm like, heavier? And he used like two inch steel with a two inch steel in the center pipe with like the most dense piece of wood on the planet that was made of concrete. And it's so heavy. And now, now I really don't want to move it. And I'm thinking maybe he's just make me a second one that's always installed in the back, just so I can hop up on either one and never have to think about it. And anyway, I love the walk board. It was something I came up with when I was designing this system back in 2010. And I said to the welder, I want to still stand with a removable walk board. I don't want hinges that fold up. I want it out of the way and I want to be able to put it in. The fish room itself, all that area behind the aquarium 
has been a wonderful experience for the last decade. I, not only did I have room for that frag tank and the huge poly tank, but when my aquarium leaked, it was 13 months old and it sprung a leak, I was able to borrow and squeeze into that room a 215 gallon reef tank to move my livestock into that. I never thought I'd put another reef in that room. I thought, I'll grow phytoplankton. I'll have a little quarantine tank. I'll you know, have salt water. And no, I ended up with a giant reef in there and that thing was in there for 18 months until my new tank was finally repaired and replaced. So the fish room is fantastic. It has six circuits in it. So I have, all, I have plugs everywhere all the time. I have a floor drain in the middle. So if any water hits, it just goes right out. I mean, it's super convenient. The light rack on the top rolls out of my way, only one direction. <laughs> so if you're in the back, it's totally in your way. Now we can't roll it forward because there's a wall. But the rolling light rack gives you full access to the tank and that's a huge perk when working in there. And uh, I have a bajillion fragging tools because every time I go to a show like this, I'm like, oh, I'll take one of those and I'll buy one of that. And I need some of those tongs. I need this and I need some more of that putty. I need that glue. And I'm always getting more. And so I never run out. So here are a couple of the colonies we took out, as you can see. I mean, it's nice to have a sense of scale. This one here on the left picture is a scrolling pavona. And that is the piece that's in my reef now. That's what we saved of the huge colony. So, I mean, we didn't like, like I said, we didn't go to tiny little frags. The one on the right is crazy dangerous. That is literally palithoa, the stuff that will kill people. It's like the James Bond movie, like take an injection of this and get somebody. I grew that stuff forever and I always felt like an evil villain, you know, but uh, I never did anything. So uh, I removed, I was like, okay, it's gotta go. And I knew it's very dangerous. I mean, very dangerous. People always talk about, you gotta wear masks, you know, don't do this, don't do that, don't, I always tell people, don't lick it, okay? I mean, it seems pretty common, but don't lick it. And <laughs> I would just, I took this out and I went over into the fish room and I peeled it off. I was wearing gloves, I believe. Peeled it off, removed it, and I was able to put the remaining rock back in my tank and it's gone. And there, believe it or not, it's not gone. Half of it's gone because <laughs> there's other areas where it still exists. And then attacking the sand bed was a huge goal, as I mentioned to you, and I explained I did it in thirds. So I did the front run weeks in advance and then he touched it up a little bit in this picture right here. And then we did the, the end, we moved everything out of the way to where we could focus on the end one night. And then, you know, when we refilled the tank with water, filtration, the next night we would work on the back. And I remember he was working in the middle of the reef and he's, whatever he's doing, I don't even know what he's doing. I was ignoring him and he didn't know what I was doing. And I was in the back where I had this huge amount of coral that was probably three feet, four feet long, all interspersed with itself. These were all things that were on the bottom of my tank that would fall to live. I called it the coral graveyard, even though nothing was dead. And it was just this graveyard of corals and they were beautiful, they were vivid, they were colonies and they completely obscured the sand bed. I couldn't get to any of that sand in years. And so I, I was back in the back removing all that and he was doing something, maybe he was vacuuming the sand. I don't know what it was. And he's like, what are you doing over there? And he looked, he goes, holy crap. You've been busy. I was like, yeah, I removed every bit of it because I was ready to attack the sand bed. I wanted to really clean that out and get as much to try to side the system. So this should be a video and you can see how brown it is, I hope. Uh, it was, I mean, you've seen brown, but it was bad and I admit it. And I remember Caitlin asked me back in like last November, well, why don't you do this more often? Well, the general rule of thumb has always been with a deep sand bed, you don't touch it. You don't mess with it, you don't vacuum it and you just let it do its job. But just like having carpet in your house, eventually you have to replace the carpet. It's not a forever carpet. Uh, you may have it for five years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever it is. But at some point you have to replace it. You cannot clean it anymore. And when they roll it up, you just, the dirt coming out of it, you're just shocked and you're thinking, oh my God, that was under my feet. That was in my home. Was I living on dirt? <laughs> so the same thing with our tanks. Eventually you will have to do this. But like someone said to me, I think it was earlier today. Yeah, they were saying that if your tank has a sand bed that's two years old or five years old, your tank will definitely you know, just die. It, it won't survive it. You have to clean the sand out or replace the sand every few years. And that's not true. This is eight year old sand. And all we did was we siphoned the heck out of it. Now we can finally get to it. We just got everything out of the way. And ever since we did this, the nitrates came down and down and down. So when he showed up, my nitrates at that point were 60. And after three days of working on the tank, he flew home and the next day nitrates were 50. And then I did one more water change after he left. 
and I worked inside the horseshoe one more time. I feel like that's the worst of the detritus. I just, I felt like the horseshoes, you know? So I focused on those. I did a 40 gallon water change, which isn't a lot of water on a 450 gallon system. And I removed some more detritus. And then it wasn't long after I did that. A couple of weeks later, I treated the tank for cyanobacteria because there was a little bit in there and I wanted to get it. I wanted to nip it in the bud. I wanted to get it before it's a big problem just to get rid of it. And after I was done, I had to change so much water to make the protein skimmer calm down that I literally cut my nitrate in half again. And all of a sudden my nitrate was like 15. I was like, wow, okay, cool. That's kind of where I want to be. I don't want to be 80. I'd like to be under 20. And now I could actually put in a pistol shrimp and it won't die. I can add an arrow crab. I could add a blood shrimp or things that are fun. The next day it went from 15 to 10 because not only had I removed all the waste from the sand bed, but I was also running a media from Brightwell that's called Nitrate R. And I really say they should have called it denitrator because come on, that's what it's doing. And I put that stuff in there and it literally was sucking it down. I was like, stop. And I removed the media that night. I was like, nope, don't want to go any further down. I don't want to go from a really high number to a super low number. I wanted to get into the target range I've always aimed for and was happy to get there. So what all this work did was it solved the problem. It removed the nitrate. That was what I wanted gone. I removed a lot of dead undergrowth that had to come out. I increased flow because now there was more open space for the water to move through the tank. And I um, started to get some color back. And then I started the Reef Diary series sometime in, I'd say August, I don't remember the date. So do any of you guys happen to know? That'd be crazy if you knew. But all right, uh, it was 100 days ago, whenever that was. During the first two weeks, the tank looked better and better and better. And during the cyano treatment, while I had the protein skimmer off for three days, I'm looking down at my reef and everything's fantastic. I mean, I was like, oh my God, my corals are back where they belong. I'm so happy. My nitrates are down, my corals are healthy, everything's clean. And then I did the big water change and I lost a lot of coral. Anyway, I'll, I'll tell you what happened in case you aren't aware. The huge water change I did in my tank ended up being 200 gallons on a 450 gallon system. I've always believed that as long as your alkalinity, your salinity, and your temperature is the same, you can change as much water as you want in one session without hurting the tank. And I still believe that. But what had happened, and it took me two weeks to find out what happened. I didn't know. And I was, there was a lot of assumptions and guessing and accusations from others. You did this and you did that. But it ended up being my tank was missing a massive amount of potassium. It wasn't down a little bit. Potassium is supposed to be 400 to 450. I have never once in my life cared about potassium. I've been in the hobby since 1997. It's a, it's a thing like iodine or iron or whatever, aluminum. I just don't think about it and I've never tested for it and I don't care. And when I was trying to determine what happened to my tank, it measured, my tank was measuring 200 instead of 400. That's a giant, it's 50% less. And I had coral colonies that went from vivid green to white overnight. They were alive, but there was no color in them. I had other corals that were green that just turned brown. I had every bit of sunset montipora in my tank and I had five areas, all closed up and died. It was just one thing that was happening after another. It was just slow death and I was like, what is happening? I just did this massive water change. I couldn't have better water if I tried. And people said, well, you should do an ICP test. And I thought, why? I have this amazing water. The tank is fantastic. I don't know what's happening with these corals, but it can't be the water. So I measured, I sent in the sample. And I had to wait a week for the answer. And it came back that it said I was really low on iron. I was really low on potassium and I was really low on something else. And I thought, well, that's really weird. Now, how do I fix it? And so I talked to a couple other reef keepers and said, what would you do? And they said, the first thing I would do is I would test it again. And I was like, I don't want to wait another week. The corals are dying as I'm, it's just deteriorating slowly every single day. And they said, well, I wouldn't do anything because you have no idea if that's an accurate test or it's a false test. I was like, yeah, okay. So I called the ICP company in Denver and said, look, if I overnight you a vial of water, will you give me the result tomorrow? And they said, absolutely. And so then the next day I took water from my reef, water from my frag tank, water from my old saltwater mix and water from my brand new saltwater mix that I just got a brand new barrel of a thousand gallons worth of salt water. And I sent in the samples and all three of the old came back with bad, bad potassium. The reef tank was like 196. The frag system was like 192. The batch of old salt water, and what I mean by old is old salt mixed with water shipped. That's what I mean. Um, but it was the old batch. 
it came back 125. And it's supposed to be 400 to 425 out of the barrel. And then the brand new batch I made was perfect. And I was like, okay, I've got good salt. I can trust this. So whatever happened, happened. I don't care. I just want to move forward and fix my reef. And I ended up dosing three liters of potassium over the next four weeks. And that's the only thing I did in my tank and the entire tank recovered. And I was able to add new corals and you know, get things looking really nice. Now this picture right here, I didn't talk about it. I remember I told you in the beginning, the hammers were so tall, I couldn't see behind them. It was like blocking my view when I looked at the end of the tank and I wanted to see the view. And so I told Dwayne, I'm gonna cut all those. He goes, okay. And I said, you're gonna glue them in the tank. <laughs> He was just like, what do you mean? I said, I'm literally going to cut off the bottom of every one of those hammers. You're going to have like a two inch stump and there's this big rock there and I want you to glue every single one of them on there side by side to make a colony. And he was like, all right. And I gave him like a thousand things to glue. And he's, he's got these polyps and I keep handing him bowls of hammer because yeah, I had this big bowl and I'd fill it up with like 10, 15 pieces, hand it up and he'd go ahead and plant them. And then I would do another one and another one. And he says, oh my God, I've never planted so much hammer in my life. And it was all in like a one foot square area. But when he got down off the ladder and looked, he goes, man, that looks really good. And that was what it looked like the next day. So I was really happy with it. And now you can see the view of the tank. The hammers are down low. You have the nice profile going up. So as you're doing a reset, you want to think, how do you want to look when you're done? You know, and there's only certain things you can control, but certain things like where corals are placed and if they're blocking the view or if they're at certain angles and how they're going to grow, you can kind of predict some of that. So this was the tank a few weeks later and it was before the potassium thing. <laughs> so that's why I was saying in the beginning of this talk, I was a little nervous to talk about the reef reset because my tank had this massive die off and people said, oh, your tank is crashing, which I still don't believe that's the right terminology. Because to me, a reef crash is when you lose everything. The water turns milky white, you're reaching in, you can't find anything, you scoop out one half live fish, every coral you had died, that's a crash. I actually remember in one of my videos when I was sharing that day and I said, well, I know there's a lot of corals gone. I'm upset about it, but there's really half a reef still here. So I should quit complaining so much because I have a lot of healthy stuff that didn't, that wasn't affected at all. But the corals that were affected by the lack of potassium screamed loudly and you know, some didn't make it. So in the meantime, it's a, now that I've done my reset, I have much better flow in the tank. I had a lot of open space to go ahead and put new corals in there. And over the last 100 days, I've added 38 new corals to the tank. And that is where we are now. So we're gonna see where my tank is in about six to nine months. I'm hoping that that area on the left side will be a lot more full and bushy like I'm used to seeing. But I actually do like the look of the tank and I, I, I'm very happy with where things are. So I uh, would love to know what your thoughts are when it comes to this. And if you have any questions, I'm sure we can take a few minutes to answer some questions. Do we do that? Do we answer questions from the audience? Just have, they have to just raise their hand and scream loudly. Oh, how did I survive the snowstorm? That's a good one. Um, that was a very scary moment. And I'm not gonna take you through all the gory details, but unfortunately on February 13th, my girlfriend died. The 14th was dealing with the aftermath of that. And that night of the 14th, the snowstorm hit Fort Worth and killed the power to, oh right, not Fort Worth, it killed power for a lot of people in all of Texas. And it was something like 20 million people didn't have power. And they were saying, you probably want to power for five or six days. Well, I had all these battery backups on my system to keep the Vortex running and I own a generator. And so I felt like I was okay, but my house is completely electric. So there's no heat, there's nothing. There's nothing I can do to warm the house. And all I cared about was the tank. And so my battery backups, systematically, every one of them failed. I don't know why. They all have their individual batteries. I, I just, I ended up replacing all that. But they all failed. I still have my generator, but my generator was acting a little weird and I didn't know what was going on. And I've had this generator a long time, but I only use it for emergencies. So it's not like it's been used at 10,000 hours. You know, it's, it's had, you know, 10 events on it. And I was on the phone with my friend in Hawaii and in the background, you heard beep, beep. And she said, what is that horrible sound? I was like, oh, I think it's like a battery backup, like a UPS that's just chiming that's got no power. And she's like, it's so annoying. I'm like, okay. So I went over there to look and it wasn't that. And I was like, oh. And I'm following the horrible sound to the controller for the Abyss return pump. And on the screen, it says warning low voltage. 
And I was like, okay, what the heck does that mean? I've never seen this message before. And you know, I've got generated power. I should have plenty of voltage. So I looked on Apex Fusion because the energy bars will tell you how much power is going to everything. And it said that my energy bar was receiving, no, we're supposed to be 120 volts. That's it, you know? It was like 93 volts. And I thought, well, that's weird. That's a weird number. Why would it be 93? And then I thought, well, I got to stop this beeping. So I slowed the abyss pump down because it's a DC driven pump. Moves slower, uses less wattage, the alarm goes away. 15 minutes later, it starts beeping or wailing at me again. And I look at Fusion, and now it says my voltage is 87. And then it says my voltage is 82. So literally, the generator is dying. And I call my tank sitter, who's smart at everything, and I said to him, what do I do? And he goes, dude, that voltage, when your voltage goes down, your amperage doubles, all those black bricks that run your vortex and what, your radions and all that, they're going to explode. And he's like, you need to deal with this right now. I was like, well, can you fix my generator? And he goes, if you bring it to me. And so I had to load the generator up, drive to his house. It was five o'clock in the evening, freezing weather, about to be dark. And I thought, well, I can get there while there's daylight. But then it took him an hour to fix it. And when he finished and we pulled the cord, it turned on, but now it was like an overdrive. And he goes, that's weird, it shouldn't do that either. I was like, will it work? Because right now everything's dead in my house. And he was like, yeah, it'll work, I guess. And so I came home, I plugged it in, and now my voltage is 140. And, I'm, and the thing's like, warning, too much voltage. I'm like, oh my God. So I thought, well, okay, I can make it through the night because it was zero degrees outside, which that never happens in Fort Worth. Zero. And, and then at one in the morning, I heard bang, bang. And the metal halides went <laughs> and then everything went dark. And I said, the generator literally blew up. I mean, I just pictured a crater where there used to be a generator. That's not what happened, but it did, it threw a drive shaft or whatever makes those things work. It's, it's completely dead. And I'm sitting there, freezing house, no power, no batteries, no girlfriend. And I'm thinking I'm about to have no reef. And my best friend said, what are you going to do? And I said, I, I guess I'll watch my reef die. I mean, I don't know what else I can do. I've done every, all my backups are failed. And... I put on Facebook, I need a generator, and I, I thought it was pointless. 20 million people need a generator, and I need one for my aquarium? You know, it's like stupid. And a lot of my friends came out of the woodwork and talked to everyone, and I had people offering me generators that were really far away. They were like, on a good weather day, an hour and a half drive. In a snow, ice storm, it would have been three, four hours there, get the thing, three, four hours back, hope it hooks up to my system, and I just thought, my, son, my reef will be dead by the time I get back from this trip. And if I drive off the road because of the ice, my dog could die in a freezing house. I'm, I cannot do this. I need to do something local. And uh, more people talk to more people. And it was somewhere around 3 in the morning, a guy two miles from my door had two generators in the garage. One was new in the box. And I said, I'm going to borrow them both. And he said, that's fine. And it still took me 30 minutes to go two miles and, and back. And then I had a Coleman lantern in my freezing garage as I'm building the generator out of the box. You gotta put the wheels on, put the oil in, you know, add fuel. Got it running. And that's how my reef survived. It was a miracle that someone had a generator and I was able to get my tank going. And I was very, very lucky. And my house was 58 degrees and my reef never got under 76. Uh, the only thing I did change out, she asked did I change anything. I got rid of all those Ecotech battery backups that I've always used. And I bought four huge batteries and I built, the, I had a friend who knows this stuff because I don't. And he and I worked on together and he created this whole, this really neat array. And now I can run Vectra pumps and all Vortex for 24 hours straight. And the only thing it can't run is the Abyss. So I've got to figure out that one because I would love to have the return pump keep the water circulating. Um, but you know, that would literally only keep up flow. That would not add any heat. Every time you plug in anything with wattage, it depletes your batteries. But to run all the low voltage stuff is ideal. And so that is it. Other than that, um, I did buy a brand new generator. And the new generator works with gasoline, natural gas, and propane. So I have some choices. Uh, you know, if, if, let's say, I can't get gas for some reason, I can steal the propane tank from a barbecue and hook that up and get a few more hours. So that's set up. And I haven't even used it once, but I, I bought it brand new. So Nothing Good. Quite, I covered it all. <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the show.